Assalamu alaikum. I'm um, Professor Abdul Rashid Skinner. Um, I'm a clinical psychologist and so have some awareness of the topics being discussed today. And it's my honour to be invited here to chair this event. I'll start with the usual housekeeping announcements. Um, I'd say turn off all electronic devices. I'm not sure what your view is, but um, I have a suspicion when people are looking at um, electronic devices, um, their heart and their whole being isn't open to actually what's being said. So um, that's my advice. And well then, alhamdulillah for today. Alhamdulillah that we're in such a beautiful building and people have organised things so well, even down to good espresso coffee. And for the speakers, um, the organisers have managed to get speakers with international reputations that I've heard of and never thought I'd meet in my lifetime. Um, so this is quite amazing. And humbler for the topic, um, there's probably no more important topic than understanding how to bring up our children well in an environment which you know, the term often comes to me, which is toxic. In fact, almost you could say state-sponsored toxicity in childhood. And um, so I've always been aware, the research has been around for years and years on the, the way children develop neurologically, what is the best age to let them play and develop crudely right hemisphere functions in the brain, creativity and so on. And what is the best age to start teaching more formal left hemisphere skills like reading and uh, writing, arithmetic, um, which is, you know, not, not in infancy. Um, and this is widely ignored. Schools actually increasingly, I think with um, SATs particularly, um, is actually narrowing our children. I noted that China recently has completely altered its education system with a much greater emphasis on the arts and on music um, because it said it doesn't want to be a nation that is just going to copy well other people's inventions. It wants to be a creative nation. Um, so both nationally but also for us as parents, and I, <coughs> I believe and all Muslims should believe that the prime responsibility for bringing up children is that of the parent, it's not the state. Um, we need to be aware of what's going on, aware that the state is often sponsoring a toxicity in terms of how children are taught at particularly an early age. And indeed, even the push to put children into nursery education at far too young an age. The research has been out for 20, 30 years, and it's overwhelming um, that what children need at a young age is its mother or at least one adult with a personal attachment to that child. And if that isn't provided, um, it leads to psychological problems, indeed drops of IQ, later on in life. So I hope these topics will be explored today. They're important for all of us. Um, and alhamdulillah, so many people have turned up to it. Um, I really was surprised that, and you're the lucky ones, 50 people couldn't get in. Um, so that there's such an interest in this topic is itself, I think, amazing. So thank you to everybody that's coming. And now my pleasure to introduce um, Sally Goddard Blythe, um, International Director of the Institute for Neurophysiological Research in Chester. Um, she's well published and her books are on sale, I presume, um, down in the foyer. Um, on an absolutely crucial area, which is the um, uh, neurophysiological development of the child and the, what's a, the way you encourage this to develop in the best way. And she's told me, she's going to talk about something which has always intrigued me, um, which is the archer's reflex in the child. 
Um, so more of that later. So over to you, Sally. Thank you. <laughs> so first of all, thank you so much for uh, inviting me to be with you today and to come to this what is actually a beautiful oasis in this big, noisy, gutsy city of Liverpool. Mm. Now, I had absolutely no idea as we drove down the street that inside here was like a, a garden, really beautiful. So, um, I'm going to start off talking to you really about laying the physical foundations for learning and putting children's biological and developmental needs first. Because as you very rightly said, the state may have one view but the state's view conveniently ignores actually what are the biological and developmental needs of childhood. And these, these are the universal factors that cross all cultures and all belief systems, really. <clears throat> and to put into context what I'm going to talk about, to give you a little introduction to what I actually do, what my main area of work is. At INPP in Chester, we specialize in assessing the physical development of children from about seven years of age who have started to produce symptoms of reading problems, writing problems, underachievement, behavioral difficulties, emotional problems. And I am what I call an upside down psychologist because instead of looking primarily at the effect of the mind on the body, my job is to see are the physical tools in place that are needed to support success in the classroom. So things like the balance and the coordination needed to sit still, the eye movements needed to <clears throat> excuse me, follow along a line of print without the eyes jumping somewhere along the line, and the auditory processing abilities to be able to hear the fine-tuning differences between similar but different sounds that support reading, spelling, speech, and so on. So our job is to carry out assessments on children and see if, a little bit like a mechanic in a garage, we can find out what isn't working for that child and more importantly, is there anything that we can do to put it right? And so we develop um, individual movement programs, which having done a very detailed two-hour physical assessment on a child, we take that child back in time to replicate physical movements he or she should have made in the first year of life, at the time that neurological connections are being formed. The theory being that if there are gaps in the system in early development, they will have problems later on, but you can go back and put that information in, in a physical sense. So our clinical program is very time and therapist intensive. And it was in answer to that, that in 1996, I thought about could we extrapolate from our individual assessment a few key tests which teachers could administer to all children in a class or to children they suspected of having underlying physical problems <coughs> to identify those who were at risk of underachieving because of these things and more importantly could we put together a general developmental movement program that could be used by all children in a class over one academic year for five to ten minutes a day. So that's the main area of my work is looking at children in clinical practice and training people how to use the various intervention programs we've developed. And the sort of problems we're looking at are reading difficulties, writing problems, may or may not have had a diagnosis of dyslexia, dyspraxia, or used to be dyspraxia, is now a developmental coordination disorder, may have come under the label of attention deficit disorder, or, more importantly, I think the children who are underachieving. Those children who are verbally articulate and clearly bright and yet do not seem to be able to perform in the classroom to the level that is expected. And there is always a reason for this. What, and our job as teachers, as clinicians, as therapists is to find out what. Why is this particular child not um, performing up to potential? And if you have a child who is consistently underachieving, that child very quickly becomes frustrated. And so we start to see behavioral problems often developing as a secondary symptom of these underlying physical factors that haven't been identified. So the whole area that I specialize in is the area of what we call neuromotor immaturity, which is sometimes used as a general term just to describe immaturity in the functioning of the central nervous system. But we are a little bit more specific about how we use that term. 
and we use it to describe the continued presence of a cluster of infant reflexes, which are usually in medical terms described as primitive reflexes, which should be there at birth, but are gradually inhibited and integrated by higher centers in the brain in the first six months of life. And in combination with retained primitive reflexes, do they also have absence or underdevelopment of postural reactions, sometimes called postural reflexes, which should develop by three and a half years of age to give us good control of balance and coordination in a gravity-based environment at a subconscious level. So we don't have to think about how do we sit, how do we stand. The postural reflex system does that at a below consciousness level like a really efficient secretary or personal assistant to the executive part of the brain. And if your PA is doing a good job, the executive can float around the world doing all the things that execs should do. But if you have a PA who's always late, who's always off sick, then the poor old executive is also off sick, suffering from stress very soon afterwards. So this system gives us a good automatic physical um, vocabulary for functioning in our environment. So what are these two little groups? Well, the first group, the primitive reflexes, are reflexes that start to develop during life in the womb. They should be fully present in the baby born at full term, at 40 weeks gestation. And in a baby who is very premature, they may, some of them may actually be underdeveloped at birth. So if a baby is born at perhaps 34 weeks, the infant rooting and suck reflexes are often underdeveloped. And that will contribute to difficulties with the baby being able to latch onto the breast to suck and to feed and so on. But if all has gone well, this baby born at full term, healthy, um, those reflexes are active for the first six months of life. And as these connections to higher centers in the brain, thank you, develop, so they are gradually inhibited or put to sleep in the brain stem. So they never entirely desert us. If there was accident or injury to higher centers at a later stage, something like um, multiple sclerosis develops or Alzheimer's disease, those primitive reflexes will be released or disinhibited in the reverse chronological order of their inhibition in the first year of life. So we do, in a sense, turn full circle. And then these later ones, they develop after birth. As I mentioned, they take up to three and a half years of life. And they are mediated at slightly higher levels in the brain. The midbrain and uh, one group, head writing reflexes, are controlled by the cortex. And we can use these reflexes as clinical tools. First of all, to identify and, if appropriate, diagnose signs of dysfunction or immaturity in the functioning of the central nervous system. So we know at what age they should and they shouldn't be there. If we start to assess a child at, say, four or six years of age and we find primitive reflexes to be present, they are showing us that somewhere in that system is functioning at a less mature level than the chronological age of the child. We can also use them as clinical tools to identify the level of physical intervention that is likely to be most effective in putting those problems right. So, for example, there are many different types of motor training programs around. Sensory integration, you could, it's almost like going into a sweet shop and being able to choose which jar of sweets looks nicest on the shelf and say, that one looks pretty, let's try that one with our class of children. Which is fine, it will work for some. But if you want to be really effective, you need to start your level of intervention at the de developmental level of capabilities of the child that you're working with. And the reflex assessment helps us to be able to do this. You can also use these same reflex um, tests as measures of change during and after an intervention program to evaluate, has your intervention been successful? So, as a psychologist, these are very useful tools because psychologists love measuring things. So long as they can measure things, they tend to feel happy. So this fits the, the psychologist model beautifully. So this takes me on to what I've already mentioned, really, that when we're looking at children in a classroom who are struggling, the first question we should ask is, is that child ready to learn? Do they have all the equipment and tools in place? And developmental readiness is the key to learning success, whatever age 
we are, even in later life, you know, it still um, holds true. And to remember that behavior is also a form of language. And that if we don't have the things that we need to cope with the demands of our environment, the difference in that equation will be seen in behavior. And if any of you could have seen me driving here this morning, you would have seen that as I get, got more and more stressed as I couldn't find things, and then the car hit a huge pothole on the way, that my language became rather immature and my behavior became less appropriate than it should have been for someone who was going to do this about an hour later. So at all ages again, we need to have the resources in place to cope with the demands of the world that we're going to, to live in and function in. And I always say that the most important ABC a child ever learns is not the formal alphabet. It's the alphabet of the brain and the body. Beginning with the ability to focus attention on one task without being continuously distracted by all the other sensory or environmental stimuli. And when we talk about attention deficit disorder, it's actually a paradoxical term. Children with ADD are not not paying attention, they're paying attention to too many things at once. They can't occlude unwanted um, stimuli to focus attention on one task. That we need good automatic control of balance, particularly static balance, to be able to sit still and to concentrate. And there was an American called Nancy Rowe who described balance, the most advanced level of balance, as being the ability to stay totally still. That when we don't have good control of balance, we tend to need to move faster, move more, just like learning to ride a bicycle. The wobble sets in when you slow down to start or stop, not when you're moving. And this is important when we're trying to help children who appear to have attention deficit hyperactivity type problems. Because um, the tendency for adults is to say, right, you haven't finished your work, you have disturbed everybody else, at playtime, you're going to stay in and finish the work that you haven't done. Whereas actually, these children need more frequent opportunities for movement in order to gain better control over those physical skills. So many of these are sort of paradoxical descriptions of the problems we're seeing. So we need attention, and we need good balance as a basis to have coordination. And those three things together are, for me, but the beginning of developmental readiness for formal education. And this is where I think the philosophy of Maria Montessori and Rudolf Steiner are probably very close to the work that we do um, at IMPP, that they are the closest, really. So let's have a little look at how all of this begins. Um, and this is one of my little grandsons the day he was born. My grandchildren have turned out to be terribly useful for, for lectures. <laughs> um, and this is little one here on the right, um, no, your left, my right, um, is in the throes of something called an asymmetrical tonic neck reflex. It's your archer reflex, which started to develop about 18 weeks in the pregnancy. And what happened was the baby was all curled up inside mum's tummy, but when it tried to turn its head to one side, the arm and leg on that side try to straighten, and the opposite one flexes. So it's sometimes been described as the fencer or the swordsman's reflex, because it's a little bit like a fencer in the on-guard position, or as you said, the archer. And that little reflex has a number of jobs to do at the time it should be active. It probably helps the baby to be born if the delivery is natural without any obstetric intervention. Because when, as a species, we learned to stand on two as opposed to four feet, we created a problem in the design of the human birth canal. And the baby has to make two 90-degree turns to get out. So it's no good the mother doing all the pushing with contractions from the top. There has to be some flexibility to the shoulders and the hips. And it's suggested that this reflex, together with several others, help mother and baby to work together as cooperative partners. And that's one of the reasons why, when a family first comes to see us, I spend a lot of time asking the mother, what was the birth process like? Was it difficult? Was it very rapid? Was it a very long delivery? Was it a cesarean section? Was it forceps? Was it von twos? Because this might give us a clue as to whether this little reflex was actually utilized during the birth process or not. It's also the earliest hand-eye coordination training a baby ever has 
because babies are a little bit like me first thing in the morning. I am incredibly short-sighted without contact lenses, and my visual world ends about here. <laughs> and this little baby at birth can only actually see it about 17 centimeters from the face, and what it sees is nothing like what you and I understand as vision now. It will see outlines and edges, bright lights, bright colors. It won't understand the features of its mother's face. And it's got to learn to use this sense of vision in cooperation with other sensory systems to develop what I describe as the adult compound sense of vision which we now use. And this little mechanism is the first lesson because as it's looking at this hand here, as the head turns, not only does the head have to turn, but the arm, the hand, and the eyes all move together. And so baby's focusing distance is extended from near point to arm's length and back again, from central vision to peripheral vision and back. And a few days or weeks later, that hand by accident will probably come into contact with a solid object. So through a combination of seeing, moving, touch, or proprioceptive feedback, gradually over many weeks and months, the brain and the visual system start to work together to have a better understanding of the world outside. So I say that the sensory integration involved is entrained through the medium of movement. And this little reflex is like the first vocabulary of movement that's hardwired into the brain stem at birth. It's not conscious, this is something that the brain already has. So, if we just change tack a little bit, do we know what the incidence of these type of problems is in the general school population? And the, 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 the main answer is actually no, we don't, but we have done a number of studies in schools in different areas. The first big study was done in Northern Ireland in 2004 in six schools, mainstream primary schools, where I went and provided the training in how to use the um, physical screening test and then I had no further involvement. The teachers carried out the developmental intervention program, and then they reassessed the children at the end of the year. And what they found was that on the physical screening test, 48% of the five to six-year-olds, and remember these are mainstream schools, still had some traces of infant reflexes, which in theory should not still be there beyond the first six months of life. And we thought, well, maybe this was just children go to school even earlier, formal school in Northern Ireland. Perhaps they were just immature, and when put under stress, there was a degree of regression or something. So we looked at eight to nine-year-olds, and we found that 35% of the eight to nine-year-olds showed a similar profile. They then compared the results from the physical screening test with educational measures using baseline measures of educational achievement. And they found that there was a correlation between less mature physical skills and lower educational performance on those baseline measures. So we've done other sort of small scale studies in the Midlands in 2013, 262 children aged six to seven years of age, and there they compared the, the results of the physical tests to national curriculum um, results and found again that there was a direct correlation between less mature physical skills and lower educational performance, irrespective of children's intelligence. So I could go on and on with these, but I think I just wanted to give you the general idea that there seems to be a much higher incidence than we would possibly anticipate there being. And if those figures are in any way representative of the general population, it suggests that nearly half of children enter the school system without all the physical tools in place which ideally they need to cope with the demands of the classroom. So it doesn't matter how good the teaching is, how well behaved that child is, they are at risk of underachieving because a system has imposed something on them before they are developmentally or neurologically ready. So let's <clears throat> skip those a little bit. And I want to show you some examples of how we might understand these problems. So this is a drawing of a 13 and a half year old boy who was being assessed in Sweden by an educational psychologist because he had a history of severe reading problems. And part of the way through the assessment, the psychologist was called out of the room to take a telephone call. And she said, well, while I'm busy, here's a picture of a Jaguar sports car, and I want you to try and copy this car. And this is what he drew. 
And I have to say, this is a very old building, uh, not building, old, old drawing. I've been doing this job for many years, um, and it was originally on an acetate. And in the days of acetates and overhead projectors, I've tried reversing it, turning it inside out, upside down. I still can't see a sports car in this drawing. And the psychologist went away and thought about it and remembered that sometimes the two eyes don't work together as a team. And as a result, the brain sees a fragmented image. And so when she saw him a few weeks later, she said, um, just as an experiment, I want you to cover one eye and I would like you to try and draw that car again. And this is what he drew. And she asked him, why didn't you tell anyone that this is what you saw? Or see, and he said, well, until you took it away, I didn't know it was. If I look over there, a car looks like a car. If I try and draw it here, I can't get the pieces together. And in all likelihood, he had problems with what's called near-point visual convergence, getting the eyes to converge at near-distance focal point with one eye breaking away with the result that the image then is not fused together as it should be. So... Even one small problem can create devastating difficulties in visual perception. And most of academic learning depends on stable visual perception. It assumes that a child sees the same as the teacher sees. So we have some more examples here. Very old, what are called Tansley standard figures. They've been around for years and years. And there is a developmental age at which you'd expect a child to be able to draw each one of these shapes with a fair degree of accuracy. Circle is three years of age, cross is three and a half, square is three and a half to four, um, the X is four and a half to five, the triangle is six, the Union Jack shape is six and a half, and the upturned box and diamond are seven to seven and a half years of age. So the next set I'm going to show you were done by a seven and a half year old boy who had surprisingly reasonably good reading but came to see us because he had terrible maths problems. He was so poorly coordinated at physical education that a school governor picked him up and carried him to end, the end of one of the races on sports day. And he was getting badly bullied in the playground because there is something about posture and body language that tells other people that you are or are not able to stand up for yourself. I was very surprised when I did my American psychology degree when it, one of the textbooks said that up to 90% of effective communication is based on the non-verbal aspects of language. Tone of voice, gesture, eye contact, whether you know how close to stand to someone, when you know, whether you know when you're boring them or not, these are all the things that we don't rec realize consciously we pick up, but we do. And if children are different, it's like a jungle in the playground. They will pick on each other, and these children are natural victims. Don't want to be, but this is what tends to happen. So when he drew these shapes, this is what he drew. And we see the top row is reasonably recognizable. But the bottom row, every time he sees an acute angle, he puts something on it that isn't actually there. And we put him onto our individual program, which involves doing infant movements with the eyes closed for five minutes a day, every day. And normally we would wait until the end of the year, because the program takes about 12 months, to reevaluate where change is taking place. But because this boy had made so much progress very quickly, we broke our own rules. And after three months, we said, let's just have a look and see if the drawings are the same. And this is the same child three months into a 12-month program. And we said to him, right, this is very interesting. Why did you do it this way the first time and this way the second time? And he said, well, it's quite obvious. Dr. Beret must have given me different shapes to copy last time. You can see they don't look the same. And, you know, we're all very good at ego protection and all these things, but actually this is what I think children are telling the truth, that the way they are seeing these things are not the same as you and I are. And that when you alter the relationship of balance and posture with centers involved in the control of eye movements, you can alter visual perception, um, which is what I do every day, really. So let's look at a few more signs and symptoms. Um, Different pencil grips, and we spend a lot of time saying to children, no, your writing would be so much better if you simply held your pencil correctly. This is how you do it. It's easy. It may be for you and me, 
But if a child has traces of this little reflex still left, it may not be easy. And this is the little infant grasping reflex we all recognize when we go to a newborn baby and we can't resist placing a finger in the palm of the hand because the, the hand clings on and we feel a connection with this child. And that's great at this age. But somewhere around eight to nine months of life, the baby, baby, first of all, starts to learn to let go voluntarily. It sits in its high chair or whatever, and it starts to drop toys. And we'll pick it up about four or five times before we get bored of this game. Child, <coughs> child does not get bored because it's learning how to let go for the first time. And that precedes the ability to do this which is necessary to be able to hold a writing instrument between the thumb and forefinger without the thumb coming underneath and the fingers wanting to hold it on top. So sometimes, you know, something like this, not all these pencil grips, may go back to something as simple as the little infant grasp reflex still being more active than it should be in a school-aged child. And then we have the whole area of posture. And a wonderful professor from um, the Hebrew University in Jerusalem made this statement that there is nothing in the mind that cannot be seen in the posture once you know how to read what that posture is telling you. And my postgraduate students who come and learn how to be practitioners, after the first week of the training, say they can never walk down a street and see people in the same way again. They come back and say, did you see how she walks and how she stands and the way so-and-so sits? And it's like a language. Once you've learnt it, you can't unlearn it. So let's look at some examples. This girl here, who is sitting with the whole of the top half of her body straight and the lower half of her body bent. And as a result, her bottom is never actually in contact with the chair. And without knowing anything else about her, we could say this child is going to have difficulty sitting still, She's going to have difficulties with concentration, and she's probably going to disturb everybody else who's sitting alongside her. And if this went on for a number of years, she might get referred for um, possible investigations for ADD, ADHD, or whatever. But she may have, but she might also have an underlying problems with um, development of postural control. This one here, who can sit still, provided she can move all the time. So she can concentrate, but nobody else sitting alongside her can. And occupational therapists will often give these children something like a wobble cushion to sit on, saying that there is poor trunkal stability or poor core stability, which there may well be, and they are trying to treat it from the trunk by developing these muscles by moving all the time while sitting. But actually, the problem may be coming from the neck area, and we'll go on to why in a few minutes. This one here, who is very demoralizing to teach. You wonder why you got bothered to get up in the morning to go to school at all. But she may actually lack the head writing reflexes that are needed to sit up straight for any length of time and have poor, poorly developed muscle tone. So she finds sitting up tiring. And here's a real child doing very much the same thing. And we see the difference between these two children. This little one on the left, who is probably teacher's pet, because he sits there and he looks attentive and he's a good little boy because he can. And then this boy here, who can only do his homework by standing on his chair, winding his legs around the chair and twisting his body. And again, we'll look at why this may be a little bit later. And then the final symptom that we may see in the classroom is signs of difficulties with auditory processing. So this is not the same as hearing impairment, that can be present with or without hearing impairment. It's how the pathways from the ear to the brain are sending information and how, how the brain is actually decoding it. And one of the problems can be difficulties with discrimination, difficulties with hearing the fine-tuning differences between similar sounds. So in English, things like th and f, sh and ch, s and f. And the only reason that you write something differently is because you can hear those differences. If you can't hear them, then the whole logic of spelling, particularly in the English language, is lost on you. Some children are slower at processing the sounds of speech than normal, which means they have difficulty then retaining information in short-term memory. So if you were to give them more than one instruction, you say, I want you to go upstairs, I want you to get your dirty washing, and I want you to bring it down, if you're very lucky, they'll go upstairs and you won't see them again for another half an hour because they're decoding part one. 
It can also change the sounds that the brain actually hears because the difference between hearing a sound as d or as t is a difference of 40 to 60 thousandths of a second in the timing of the onset and offset of the first and second burst of sound. So you're probably all familiar with watching the evening news or something where you see the um, news reader asking an overseas correspondent, a journalist, a question. And there's a fractional delay when it goes up to the satellite and then before he hears. And this is a little bit like what auditory delay is like for a child. So it can affect concentration, working memory, and even how they hear. And then we also need to be able to locate external sources of sound in order to be able to make um, a decision as to whether we attend to them or we ignore them. So the beginning of selective attention in an um, auditory sense is the ability to locate sounds, such as somebody's just coughed, there's children out there playing. If I was trying to find out where they were coming from all the time, it would take my attention away from what I'm doing. So we need to have this orientation to sound in order to develop selective attention. And if we don't have, we can become what is called stimulus bound, that that stimulus will override everything else we're trying to do. And we can also have something else, which is hyperacusis or hypersensitivity, where some children can hear as, sounds as quiet as minus 10 decibels. When a medical hearing test is done, it's done at a standard volume of 20 decibels, which is like a quiet conversation. And medically, they will accept as low as 40 decibels as being adequate to cope in a noisy classroom. In actual fact, the background level of noise in a well-disciplined classroom is usually about 40 dB. You need to have much more acute hearing to be able to select salient sounds and to ignore irrelevant ones. So hyperacusis, um, those children who are hypersensitive have the opposite problem. They hear too much and they can't cope with the environment. And we see this particularly in um, sections of the autistic spectrum population. Can be present in others as well, but tends to be most prevalent in autistic spectrum disorders. So all I've talked about so far is the um, obvious symptoms that we might see, what I call the icing on the cake, visual problems, auditory problems, bit of clumsiness. What is less talked about is the system in the middle, the vestibular system, which is our balance mechanism. <coughs> And all these other sensory and motor systems have to work in cooperation with the balance mechanism um, in order to function efficiently. So if there is any underlying problem with balance, what you may see is symptoms in one of the higher order functions, whereas the underlying um, problem is actually coming from a problem with balance. And these are sometimes described as different labels. And this is why I asked you whether you were a psychiatrist or a clinical psychologist before we started. Because I was at a conference in London a number of years ago where a um, pediatric psychiatrist started his talk with if mainstream doctors were allowed to diagnose mental illness in the way that psychiatrists are, they would be struck off the medical register. His, his, words, his words, not mine, I have to say. Um, because he said most mental illnesses are diagnosed on the basis of the subjective description of the clinician rather than on path lab tests. There isn't the, um, the rigorous um, evidence to support those diagnoses. And it's simply the way it is. We don't have the tests available. But this is also true of how behavioral problems and specific learning difficulties tend to be labeled. They are, at best, a description for a set of symptoms that seem to fit most easily under that label. They are not necessarily a definitive prediction for life. And often they are treated in that way, and I see that as a big problem. So why I show this diagram is that although each category has its own specific diagnostic criteria, where they overlap, is where we often find that neuromotor immaturity is a common denominator underlying some of the symptoms in those diagnostic categories. Now, we can't say if we, func if we put the NMI right, they would cease to be autistic or, or have dyslexia. They may still have those problems. But in my view, if you could work with those areas, they would be functioning at a higher level 
within or without that diagnostic label. So I want to show you some examples of the sort of things that one can do. These are the examples of children's drawings in a school that we were, have worked in for a number of years in Carlisle, where they've used our very short teacher's test battery, and they've come up with a physical score, a um, test for neurological immaturity score, which is your neurological score um, under the drawing on the left-hand side. If the child had no immaturity, they'd have scored 0 out of 40. If they'd had 100% signs of neuromotor immaturity, they'd have scored 40 out of 40. So this child's score of 21 is showing you that there's about 50%. And we've then used the draw-a-person test. Are you all familiar with a draw-a-person <coughs> test? No? Where you simply give the child a blank sheet of A4 paper and a pencil, and you say, I want you to draw a picture of a human figure. It mustn't be a cartoon character, um, and it mustn't be a stick man. You don't have to be a great artist, just draw the best, best picture you can. And we see what they do. We don't time them or anything. And there are a couple of scoring systems which will give you either a percentile score for the um, quality of the drawing, or a mental age compared to chronological age. And what we see here is the child on the left had a 50% immaturity, and if there were 100 children performing together, he would have been 14th from the bottom. Forget that for a moment. I simply want you to look at that drawing on the left and tell me, because the child's drawing of a human figure tends to be, represent how they feel themselves to be physically from the inside, what do you see in that drawing? What do you notice? Be brave. <laughs> No hands. So what might you think that might be telling us? Powerless in his environment. Yes. Anything more specific? Possibly the fine motor skills. We, we can't overinterpret from this, and the scoring system does that part for us, but the drawing actually tells the story. The thing I notice most is that he's asymmetrical um, in his posture, and he's unbalanced. That's the first thing I see. But children usually leave off the part of the body that isn't working very well for them. Um, so if then fingers are not very good, they'll tend to leave that part off the drawing. This is the same child nine months later on the right-hand side, having simply been through the general developmental class-based program. So the first question is, can you improve that neurological score by bringing it down? Because doctors are still taught in medical school that if primitive reflexes persist, they are a sign of pathology and there is nothing you can do about it. And the children we are working with are what we call grey area. No pathology has been identified, but somewhere something hasn't come together quite as it should. So in this child, the answer is yes. That score has come down from 21 to 2. And the percentile score has gone up from 14 to 77 for this one measure of nonverbal cognitive performance, which is what the draw a person test gives you. So something in addition to just changing physical, physical coordination must have happened. So let's look at a few more, because we always have one child in a class who makes exceptional progress. So we might have been lucky with that one. So this is the same class. And this, I think, is a very bright child because high neurological score, so a lot of problems, 23 out of 40. But at the first assessment, 68 on a centile rating scale. So it would have been very easy to look at this child and saying, performing above average, above 50, so we don't need to worry about him or her. But what happens if we are able to do anything about that physical score? Well, apart from the fact the next drawing looks as if this child has been through premature puberty, um, <laughs> the neurological score has come down to three and a half, but the percentile has gone up to 68, uh, to 99. So this child was probably a very intelligent child, able to use their intelligence to compensate for the underlying dysfunction, but at the expense of underachieving. And this is where I think the neurological test, together with things like the draw a person test, should be used actually with every child at the time of school entry, and again at key stages through the education system, to pick out those children who are unnecessarily at risk and to put the right intervention in to help them be ready um, in a physical sense for the demands of the classroom. So there's lots more here, just showing the, the changes on the class-based programme. 
What I'd like to show you next is just a very short DVD from the school involved, because in about three minutes I think they're able to show you what they were doing in school. I have to say that some of the exercises are, were not being done correctly and they are showing general physical education classes, uh, exercises as well, so it's not all our programme. Learning is not all in the head, but a physical activity. Our work, which we're passionate about, aims to improve children's physical literacy and thus their personal dignity and self-esteem. Each one of us is born with a set of primitive reflexes which should disappear naturally as we develop and mature. Retention of some of these reflexes is known to impede the development of higher order brain functioning and subsequent motor control, eye functioning, eye hand coordination, perceptual and listening skills. Children learn with their bodies before they learn with their brains. In fact, Movement is our first language. Because the education department is so focused on cognitive learning and we as a health service are so focused on disease, between us we have missed out on this vital transitional developmental phase. This program redresses this imbalance and provides physical education in the truest sense of the word. We use curriculum time to follow a daily programme of exercises which give the brain a second chance to register movement patterns which should have been made at the appropriate stage of development. From my point of view as head it's having a significant impact not simply on the children's general development and learning but also on the personal and social development. The staff are fully behind the programme because they see that it brings enormous benefits for children. The children are more able to settle quickly to lessons, they can concentrate for longer periods and also their listening skills have improved. Movement has helped me in my music because I can concentrate for longer and I can spread my fingers out further on the saxophone. In the research cohort, 75% of the children made an average gain of five standardised score points in reading. It's made a massive improvement in my handwriting and how long I can write for without stopping. In the PE programme it's helped to develop the children's core motor skills which gives all children access to the PE curriculum. We've worked with the school, um, helping them do, deliver the project in school. We then did it as a cluster approach and we're now delivering it right across the partnership and we've just trained 90 teachers to deliver it. It's an excellent opportunity because it shows how movement and physical activity can impact not just on the physical education curriculum and achievement of children, but on attainment right across the whole primary curriculum. We move to learn and we learn to move. We do not necessarily aim to produce perfect athletes, but we do want our children to be fit for learning and fit for life. So I said I'd touch a little bit on these reflexes in more detail. So this is the first one I mentioned when I talked about the hand-eye coordination training. So it has these number of functions to fulfill in the first six months of life. Um, but rather like visitors who you've invited to stay with you for the weekend, if they're still there three weeks later, they're not quite as welcome as they were when they first arrived. And this, all of these early reflexes are the same, but if they stay for too long, they will start to interfere in subtle ways with higher functions. So if it stays too long, it can interfere with the control of upright balance, because when the head is turned to one side, if this side of the body wants to bend, it throws the center of balance depending on the head position. It can affect the ability to cross the midline of the body when the head is turned to one side because this side of the body wants to extend. It doesn't want to come to the centre and it certainly doesn't want to cross over and start doing complex fine motor skills on the other side. It can affect hand-eye coordination, particularly when writing. Because as long as your head's in the middle, no problem. But as you start to turn your head to follow what your hand is doing, again, it wants to run away. And children have found ways of compensating how they hold the pen, how tightly they hold it, the angle they sit at. But at the end of the day, they never become automatic in the mechanics of writing. It's something they always have to think about and make the hand work. And that can interfere with the ability to think and write at the same time. So they're often, particularly boys actually, 
um, boys who are verbally very articulate, but ask them to write down what they've just told you, and you're lucky if you get about two or three lines, and then they want to go off and do something else, because it's just too difficult. Um, let's take this one. This one here, we've already seen signs of in some of the children's posture, where just before a baby is ready to get up onto hands and knees, it tries to push itself up off the ground. And as it puts its head up, its arms straighten, and its lower half of its body bends. If it tries to do the opposite and put its head down, the arms bend and the feet come up, which is fine, <coughs> so long as they don't get stuck at that stage. So most babies will go through a phase of rocking on hands and knees, which helps control it, and then they'll go backwards for a day or two before they can get the coordination of both ends to go forwards. If it's still active, when they come to sit and they try and put their head down, the arms want to bend, lower half of the body wants to straighten. So you get the two ends of the body wanting to work in opposite ways. And that makes sitting still very difficult because you need, actually, to be able to keep your head in a position, keep your upper body straight, knees bent, and be teacher's pet sitting in the right position. So here we see some pictures of babies doing it. Little boy here, he's still in the throes of the extension part of it. And had he not got over that part, he would have been a bottom shuffler. And in his developmental history, it was said he didn't crawl. He was a, a bottom shuffler, which by itself, so what? But if he didn't crawl because he couldn't, then it starts to become interesting. This is a typical sitting position of children who still have that symmetrical tonic neck reflex. I want to sit in what we describe as a W leg position, and therefore sitting cross-legged is very, important, very uncomfortable for them. Because I want to go on to what factors in the early years can influence the course of neurodevelopment. Well, we have the genetic blueprint, but we know that the law of um, genetics go back at least four generations. So what we often see is a thread or possibility that weaves its way through the fabric of subsequent generations, may turn up in one and then not appear, up in, appear in two or three, and then in a whole cluster of cousins and whatever in another generation. But we also have to remember that those genetic possibilities are also suppressed or expressed as a result of what happens environmentally from preconception right through to the, the adult years. So th this is a sort of new buzzword in, in science, is epigenetics, the interaction of the genetic possibilities with the environment and how the environment can shape um, that genetic possibility in different ways. The preconceptual environment of both the father and the mother, and this is something which is my sort of political soapbox for the next few years, I think. I feel very strongly that teenagers in, um, whether you call it personal development education or sex education in schools, they should be taught about the biological and developmental needs of children and how what they do with their lives as young adults potentially will influence the health and development of their children later on in terms of the food they eat, the um, lifestyle and so on, that the birth process can actually turn things one way or the other. We can have underlying neurological factors from birth or those that develop increasingly is what I believe I'm seeing as a result of lack of environmental, environmental opportunity in the early years. Children who are not getting the opportunities to play outdoors, to have robust physical play, to remember that actually we are part of the species of mammal and in other mammals, unless they are allowed to engage in rough and tumble play, as they grow up, they are rejected by the pack because they haven't developed the physical skills to know how to interact with each other. It's an interesting um, analogy, really. So sensory development, physical interaction, engagement, and attachment in the early years and throughout childhood. And I often say that the first love affair of life is a child's unquestioning love for its parents. A baby doesn't know whether its parents are going to be good or bad parents at birth. All it knows is that it needs them and that the parents are its universe until it's able to help itself. So the nature of that relationship will have a profound effect on that child's emotional development for the later remainder of life. And in our modern, increasingly technological society, through good and economic times and bad, being a parent is the one thing in which we are all <coughs> equal in our potential to influence society in the future. Because the way that we bring up our children is actually society's future. Um, and it's the one universal um, leveling ground in many ways. 
To remember that different systems are vulnerable to um, damage at different stages in development. So this just shows how the central nervous system where the red bar is, is vulnerable really all the way through pregnancy, less so in the latter part, but there is still the potential for damage. And that different organ systems will be are most vulnerable at the time of most rapid development and proliferation. They're what, call, they're what are called critical periods or sensitive periods. Um, to look at the whole area of attachment, um, this is actually one of my sons with his grand, his, no, my grandson, <laughs> um, on the day he was born. And I just happened to capture it because it said everything to me, this moment of, of getting to know you. This is a physical thing. You get to know and to become attached through that physical contact. Um, and that movement is a baby's first language, beginning with gesture and with mime, and then with music. So these are two little twins, more of my grandchildren. I've got an awful lot of grandchildren um, here. Who You can see that they, they understand each other through this language of gesture and what this little boy is trying to say. And, and this here is um, linked into the work of Colwyn Trevathan, Professor Emeritus at the University of Edinburgh, who started his professional career as a biologist then went into zoology and eventually psychology. So he's gone from microorganisms to, I'm not sure if we are more sophisticated, but that's the general view. Um, and he's worked together with the Department of Music at the University of Edinburgh, analyzing early infant and mother communication. And they put mother and baby conversations through a spectrograph and were able to show that that conversation has all the elements of a classical musical composition. It has phrasing, it has melody, it has timing, it has answering phrases. And he shows a, um, some, video, some video footage where the mother comes in and she goes, oh, da, 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 da. And being a clever mother, sympathetic mother, she waits. And if she waits for long enough, the baby goes, la da 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 da. And they show this carrying on, and then they show a rather ignorant adult coming in from outside, and it starts talking to the baby, going, blah, 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 and carries on, and the baby sits there as if to say, well, don't you understand the rules of good manners, that if I'm going to talk to you, you need to wait for me. So this is a very, very short little piece of a mother talking to her baby, and I think it illustrates how the waiting is so important. The baby needs time to process what mum has just said. And then what did you do? <laughs> really? And what else? What else? <laughs> uh, and then what? What else? <coughs> and what did you do after that? <coughs> this is just to show some of the normal stages that if a baby is given free space to develop, this is what a baby will do by itself. It will learn head control, neck control, upper trunk control. That's going to support sitting posture later on. Um, and then we go on to getting ready to roll, rolling over, playing with its feet, that's how it starts to learn where its body begins and ends in space, is by putting your foot in your mouth. That's the most important arena of discovery in the first few weeks and months of life. I haven't got time for this, but modelling of behaviour, why fathers matter, because they bring a whole different set of skills to parenting from what mothers do, and we need that balance and why the electronic media is no substitute for social engagement. That whereas in conversation, as we saw with that little baby, the mother waits, she adapts her response to what the baby has said back. Entertainment provided through electronic media is preset. It's pre-programmed. It's not interested in what the baby does or doesn't say back. It will continue with what it's going to do and it will mold the baby's behavior to the constraints of a digital piece of software. It's not the same process at all. It also alters levels of dopamine, but we haven't got time to go into that. Um, just looking at one how... One minute. One minute. 
Natural, childhood, natural childhood should allow the space and scope for imagination and exploration. I love this picture on the left because it says, I wonder. And I'm lucky enough to be old enough to remember when childhood in this country was like that. Um, risk assessment, we need risk, otherwise how do you learn to take care of yourself? The best times are free and what needs to be done. So I hope I can do it in a minute. Um, I further rigorous large-scale research into the relationship between motor skills and educational performance. We've done what we can, but we're a small private organisation. It needs proper academic, independent research following up on that. I think that there should be developmental testing, children's physical development of all children at the time of school entry and key stages through education. The implementation of effective research daily physical programmes into schools if they're needed. Flexibility within the education system to allow children an extended period of time to develop physical skills, either before entering formal school or in the first years of school if required. Improved awareness and education of parents, training to teachers, trainee teachers and teenagers of the importance of physical development to support, uh, in, child, in childhood to support learning. Improved interdisciplinary communication and cooperation between the professional domains of medicine and education from birth through the school years, because I make a living on the fact that these are the children who slip through the net. They're not bad enough to be picked up medically, but neither do teachers know what to do with them. Improved education of the general public of what children need in the early years, because there's an increasing ignorance of actually well, what child seats do and blah, blah, blah. And finally, this is my thing, I think as a society we should value the role of motherhood more than we do. Um, that we were talking earlier about how economics actually now drives parenthood. It's, the, it's not looking at what is best for children. So, I've finished. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed.